Andrea, I appreciate it. Um, thank you. First of all, thank you uh, to everyone for, for having me. I appreciate it. And thank you for all the hard work that, that you all do on the ground to, to make this stuff happen. Uh, New York is, is certainly a leader when it comes to invasive species management. So I, I thank you for that. And just real quick, you may be wondering why somebody in Kentucky was even doing any work in New York. Um, I, uh, I grew up in, in Syracuse, New York, and I actually went. I got my undergraduate degree from Cortland. So I am a New Yorker. My family still lives there. And I've defected to the south, but uh, I still have quite an affection for, for the Finger Lakes region, especially because I, I grew up on those lakes. So just a, a little bit about me um, so you know kind of where I'm coming from. What I want to talk about today is, is education broadly in terms of invasive species and ways that we can track and monitor a, a education programs specifically to really show what, what we're doing. Um, you, I, you know, everybody on this call does great work, and a lot of times when it comes to invasive species management, the social aspect of it tends to be neglected. And also looking at the uh, effectiveness of our educational programs and our outreach efforts um, those need to be tracked as well. So that's going to be kind of one of my main thrusts that I'm going to talk about today, and specifically looking at boaters uh, as we go as we go through this. So I'm going to just start out real quick with some stuff that you uh, on this call already know. So, um, but just to provide a little bit of background, obviously invasive aquatic invasives are are a big issue um, for all the reasons listed here. You know, looking at boaters specifically, obviously. Uh, boaters, and also when we're talking about boaters, we're looking at uh, boater education programs, but also, you know, what are people doing while they're out boating? Are they recreation, recreating, just hanging out with the family, or are they uh, anglers? Um, you know, what, what are their motivations for being out there? So the, the, the water recreation uses and the impacts of invasive species is really what we're going to focus on today. And obviously a lot of communities re rely on this without um, without these opportunities to, to recreate uh, you know, lakes and open water, whatever the case may be, that, that impacts local communities and the tourism dollars that come in through those activities. So obviously um, any impact that invasive species may have on those recreational opportunities could be seen, could have a, a cascading effect leading to um, issues with tourism as well. Um, so kind of getting back to the recreation piece, the and what we're going to look at today, too, is, is kind of the unique nature of, of central New York um, and the unique in terms of, you know, uh, the accessibility that a lot of the lakes have in the Finger Lakes region specifically. You know, you can, you can hop in your car and you can go to three or four lakes if you want to. Some of the lakes are connected by, by rivers. Um, you know, obviously in northern New York you have – um, you know, even more interconnectedness in the Adirondacks between all those lakes and, and rivers up there. So recreational use has a tremendous uh, impact on, on the spread of invasive species, at least it potentially can. Um, so, you know, moving within a body of water or moving from body of water to body of water, uh, the, the, the transport is, is, is a major concern. And, and through what I just heard from you all, it sounds like there's a lot of these steward programs that are happening to educate folks and search their boats and all that and all that. So that's that's encouraging to hear. Um, but that's that's kind of what we're going to be looking at today is well how how do these these stewardship programs work? Um, what are some things that we can do to, to make sure that we're showing that they do work? Um, and again, as everybody on this call knows, prevention is 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 a better way to go about this in terms of uh, time, effort and money and, and in contrast to control. If we can prevent these things from happening, that's going to be the most cost-effective way to, to prevent uh, impacts from invasive species. The uh, Finger Lakes Institute at Hobart and William Smith Colleges, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with them on this call. Uh, Lisa Kleckner uh, and I have, have worked on this project together, um, and I appreciate her support to, to do so. Um, so this is just, you know, something real quick to, to talk about them and give me an opportunity also to, to, to say what great things that they're doing in, in the Finger Lakes region um, to help with the, to help stop the spread of, of the invasives by, by boaters. 
So uh, the Watercraft Steward Program that, that they have been implementing for a couple years now, depending on funding, as, as I'm sure you're all very aware, um, the what's going to be what's going to be used for this study is looking at how these watercraft stewards and the educational opportunities that they take when looking at boaters, uh, you know, checking their motors, checking their trailers, checking their live wells. How is that? How is that helping? A with education. Um, and B, which is outside the scope of this study, but also B, the the um, the reduction in the spread of, of invasives through you know actually catching them and removing them. And um, but we're going to be focusing mostly just not mostly we are going to be focusing just on the educational piece for this particular talk today. Um, but this is really the first step, right? So these the, a lot of folks uh, that do these things on a regular basis. A lot of the literature. Uh, when it comes to looking at boaters and their awareness of invasive species, um, and even anglers and other types of recreational users, uh, you know, they they have a very basic understanding of what invasive species are. Um, some people have very distorted views, but uh, in some of my past research, it's been shown that a lot of their information comes from news media outlets, um, which we know is is not always the best way to go. Um, you know, I actually found in a in a study that I did at Cumberland Island National Seashore, looking in South Georgia, looking at invasive species. One of the outcomes was that the more exposure that people had to media messages about invasive species, the the less they actually knew. Um, so that's that's a little disconcerting. Uh, so these these people that do these watercraft stewards are super super important in disseminating accurate um, recent. Uh, scientifically based information to these folks so it can be tempered with the stuff that they hear in the popular media. So this study was done to, to look at how, how effective these educational programs were. And I'll talk about some of the potential limitations of this. But what we really wanted to know was just looking at general perceptions, attitudes, and support for different management actions in terms of aquatic invasives. Uh, so looking at it in a very general sense. So what do people know about invasives? Um, you know, what are their kind of general perceptions of them? And also proposing some different management actions that can be taken to control invasives and how supportive they are of those different control methods. And then the second part is looking at um, one lake that had uh, the stewards present and another that did not. And again, I'll talk about a little bit of the limitations of that, and then kind of comparing the two to see if there was any difference, um, which you know could could give us some insight into how effective these these education programs are slash were. So what we did, um, again, with the help of the Finger Lakes Institute, and I say we, the Finger Lakes Institute did uh, a large uh, chunk of this. So I was I helped with creating the survey. Um, going over the methodology and doing a lot of the analysis um, for this. But, um, you know, I, I certainly don't want to take credit for, for all of it because I, I had a less than 50 percent, uh, if not even lower, um, participation in this. I didn't, they had a great uh, student that did a lot of the work on the ground, which I will mention later. But what we did was we did basic uh, on-site surveys, right, um, looking at all those things that I just went over in terms of knowledge, attitudes, and support for um, different management actions. It was administered in the summer of 2013 at Canandaigua and Canisius. And uh, the Canandaigua Lake had stewards present in 2012. Canisius Lake did not. And then we went and surveyed uh, on 20, in 2013. The caveat here is that stewards were, were present in both sites in 2013, which can confound some of the data a little bit. Um, and we'll get into that um, as we as we get to the results. But uh, even with that, I think having no stewards present at one lake one year and the other can still give us some insight into the effectiveness of these programs. Um, the, uh, the the Hobart and William Smith College student did a fantastic job. Collected two two hundred surveys at both of the boat launch sites at Canandaigua and Canisius. 
had a fantastic response rate. Most people were pretty amenable to taking the survey, which was great. It wasn't a very long survey. We're talking about five to ten minutes, so the burden was not too bad in terms of um, asking people to take their time. And this was after people were taking out of the lake, so they've already done their recreation, um, so that's important uh, because people, obviously, when they're getting ready to go in, are less, less likely to do it. And in terms of looking at the comparisons, they did some simple t-tests and some chi-square tests to look at the differences between the two lakes, and we also did, uh, I looked at effect size, and effect size, for those that may not be familiar with it, just basically determines how strong um, the difference is between the two means that we're going to be exploring. Uh, and I'll go over that here in a second once we have an example to look at. So overall basic results, so kind of demographic type results. Um, this is looking at both lakes at the same time. So this is the pooled sample of 400 folks that took the survey. Uh, you can see that it was pre predominantly male. Um, we had the largest age group was between 40 and 59, uh, which may not be surprising. Repeat visits were 87%, which again is not surprising for the area. 96% of the people were from New York. And it says 56% uh, rec and 44% fishing. And the way that we delineated those was obviously fishing, anglers, that's, that's pretty self-explanatory. But recreation was going out with your family, water skiing, tubing, um, you know, almost anything except for fishing because those, those two user groups are distinct in the literature and also we'll see here um, as, as groups in terms of how they see, per, per, they see invasive species and uh, their perceptions of management. So that's why we had those two different types in terms of user groups. Um, okay, so again, we're looking at the pool sample, overall perceptions. So if you see this first one here, seven equals not a problem, one is a serious problem. So it looks like overall people are, are perceiving uh, invasive species as being an, uh, an important issue. Uh, you, you might like to see that mean a little bit closer to one, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, below the neutral point in terms of a serious problem. So, and then the sense of urgency is even higher. So one being a high sense of urgency, you can see the mean close to three there. People see it as an urgent problem. And then finally, uh, how often do you feel, how often do your fellow users check for hitchhikers? And one is every time and seven is never, right? This, is, this could be uh, uh, related to some so social desirability in terms of what people will say. Um, that seems a little high to me, but, um, you know, that's something we could talk about if you'd like. But, uh, you know, uh, three, so, just about every time people are saying that they check uh, for hitchhikers and plants and animals before entering a body of water. Uh, again, this is still overall, this is looking at the pooled sample still, overall management perceptions. So again, we asked some questions about what people thought in terms of different things. Um, the first one is about transport laws, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So one is strongly support, so you can see that people are pretty supportive. The standard deviation is a little bit high for this one, so just to make a note of that. Um, so the answers were a little variable. Um, but people in general were supportive of transport laws to prevent the movement of invasive species. And then the bottom scale, seven is uh, acceptable in all cases. This is, you can see people are, are relatively unsure. Um, boat cleaning stations, inspect all, expect boats at all launches, uh, work with community volunteers to monitor locations. Um, and you can see, I guess the people are unsure about those questions, but the last one, leave invasive species alone as a management action, that's encouraging to see that people think that that's unacceptable. Um, you know, obviously if that mean was a little bit higher, uh, we'd have some concerns there, but people, it looks like, uh, recognize that uh, invasive species is an issue, as we saw from some of the questions before, and that we can't just leave them alone because uh, that could lead to potential problems. Now, let's take a look at the difference between the two lakes. So this is, again, this is some of the demographic information, um, just splitting it up between the two lakes. We had even samples at both lakes, so we can make some really great comparisons. Um, you can see uh, the, the only real significant difference for these uh, demographics is the gender and the sex, which is Canisius Lake had 
76% male, and if you see there, the chi-square showed that that was a very significant, statistically significant difference between those two populations. Age was relatively the same, repeat visits was relatively the same, uh, New York residents. The rec type was different. Um, you can see that at Canandaigua, it's primarily recreational users, where at Canisius, it was the majority um, anglers. So keep that in mind as we go through the rest of these results. So doing a simple t-test just to look at the difference of means between the two. Um, again, if you look at the, this is the seven point scale. Do you check your, your boat before, um, do you check your boat for AIS before entering a body of water? You can see that Canisius Lake users said that they do it more often than Canandaigua. Um, and Canisius Lake also has a higher sense of urgency than Canandaigua. And these are all significantly different. If you look at the bottom of this slide, it, it looks at the effect size. Again, that, that determines the, um, so if you see the first one, it's 3.02 and 2.56. How meaningful is that difference? And that's what the effect size looks at. The effect size for both of these um, is both minimal, which means that, yes, we have a significant relationship, but the differences may not be as, um, as big as they look on the surface. But you will see a trend as we go through this here, right? So Canisius Lake is, is uh, uh, they say they check their boats more often, and they have a higher sense of urgency in terms of AIS management. The Canisius Lake users, um, reported hearing, seeing, or reading about AIS more than Canandaigua Lake users, and we can talk about why that might be. Canisius Lake was also more interested in fishing than recreational use, which could be um, a, uh, a big reason for the difference. And if you look at the, the, uh, the, the five for that, which is the effect size measure underneath the chi-square, there's a typical relation, which means that it's, it's, it's a pretty strong relationship in terms of the difference between those two. So the difference is actually quite large between Canisius and Canandaigua Lake users in terms of what they like to do. Um, Canisius Lake users were also more concerned about the impacts of fishing. I think you're beginning to see a trend here. And again, the phi, which is the effect size measure, is, is minimal to typical, which means that there is a, a pretty large difference in how people see that, that type of thing. So looking at all this, um, the, there, was a, there was a market difference. So first of all, I guess the pool sample, it looks like people understand, right, from, from the basic questions that we asked. And we kept the survey to, to, to uh, pretty short so we weren't burdening people. It's hard to get recreational users to do surveys. You have to make them relatively short or they won't want to do them. Um, but it looks like, you know, on the surface, they understand, with the pooled sample, they understand that invasive species are an issue. They understand that there's, they also exhibited a sense of urgency. So I would take those as positive signs that some of the work that's being done by you all is, is getting across to them somehow. 2% um, of respondents indicated that boat inspections would be unacceptable in all cases. So I put that in there to show that um, even though a lot of people were kind of in the middle in terms of these management actions, there wasn't anybody that really, especially in this case, that were like, no, absolutely 100% not. You know, this is my interpretation of the data based on the literature and also on this study is that I think if people would understand more the, requi the reason for this, which people don't fully understand, I think you would see that mean start to go up in terms of acceptability on some of those uh, proposed actions that we looked at earlier. But I think the, the, the great thing here is that people are not completely opposed to these things, so that's great. Okay, in terms of the different lakes, you know, again, a pattern kind of developed here, user types. It looked like at Canisius Lake we had primarily anglers, at least that took the survey. Um, so anglers are going to be potentially a little bit more knowledgeable about invasive species because it's directly impacting the recreational choice. Uh, you know, boaters that go out for, you know, family engagements or tubers or water skiers, maybe invasive species aren't going to be as much of a concern if you're out in the middle of the lake. If you're, if you're fishing the, the edges, if you're fishing some of the, uh, the inlets, invasive species could be more important because you, there may be uh, impacts in those areas, where as opposed to the middle of the lake, there might not be as many. Um, that's just one particular, um, you know, uh, conclusion that I'm making. In terms of stewards, uh, 
Does it show that the stewards are having an impact? Um, I, I don't know if we can necessarily say that from this particular study, because if you look at it, the lake that did not have the stewards actually kind of showed uh, that they had more knowledge, understood the issue more. So is it a matter of the education program or is it a matter of the particular recreation type that is occurring at that lake? We weren't able to tease that out as a result of this. Um, but what I can say, at least what I think, based on previous work that I've done too, and, and you all know this, is that tailored educational programs might be the way forward, right? So if anglers and uh, recreational users as defined for this study have different needs, which they do, then targeted programs at those particular user groups might be more effective as opposed to just a blanket education program. Of course, that leads to, you know, that's more money, that's more time, that's more effort, which, you know, not a lot of you have. I, I understand that, but it's, it's simply a recommendation in terms of trying to find ways forward to, to make these things effective. And data, and this is really what I want to hit on here, is that data needs to be collected over time and we need to keep revisiting these, right? So as your, as your, as your watercraft steward programs expand across the state and people get more exposure to these messages, my, my guess is, right, based on, on, on this study and others that I've done, is that people will be more accepting of the management options, right? Initially, people are usually resistant to um, any sort of, uh, in, in, excuse the word, but invasive uh, management techniques that infringe on people's ability to enjoy their recreational activities. But over time, as people understand them and they become more used to them, that acceptability typically goes up. So that's something that we need to monitor over time to see if that's happening. Because if it's not, then we, meet, we, we, meet, we may need to look at how we're approaching the issue and potentially go about it differently. Um, so tracking the success of these, these steward programs, any educational programs, that I, I can't stress enough how important that is. Um, and I understand that you know, with limited resources, that's not always possible. But the data that you all collect, um, we, you know, we need to get that out to the public and we need to let them understand why these programs are important, and we also need to make sure that we track success, hopeful success over time to show that what we're all doing is actually working. Uh, so with that, I just wanna say thank you. Um, again, I can't thank uh, Lisa Kleckner again at the Finger Lakes Institute enough. She was extremely supportive of, of my help with this project, and it was great for me to get up to the Finger Lakes and help out when I could. Um, you know, I, I, I miss the long winters in upstate New York, but summer in upstate New York and the Finger Lakes is, is something I will remember forever. Um, and also Sarah, um, she's, she was the student that did pretty much all the data collection, so obviously thank her, her very much for, for the work that she put in that summer to collect all that data. So with that, um, is there any questions? And thank you.